Fantastic. Hi, everybody. Hello. Good morning. Good evening, wherever you are in the world. Uh, we've got a, an amazing. Wherever we are in the world, but now we're we're stuck behind a screen. Probably some of us enjoying a glass of wine uh, already. Uh, me, I have to wait a little bit longer, unfortunately. Um, huge welcome to my panel. Uh, we've got two members, which will hopefully uh, still make it. Uh, they're just having technical difficulties. We'll still dial in. Uh, very briefly, my name is Mark Hamill. Um, I'm the CEO of the Virtual Advisory Board. Um, delighted to uh, chair this session today. Um, again, on repositioning boards in times of disruption. Um, I'm joined, I'll very briefly introduce the three members and then get them to say uh, a little word about themselves. Uh, Luisa Delgado, Steve Blickman and Alicia, we're delighted to have you all here today. Thank you so much. Luisa, would you give a quick introduction? Um, yes. Hello. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm calling in from Europe. Um, I have a corporate background uh, spanning fast-moving consumer goods, um, tech as well as luxury um, and um, for the past uh, two and a half years I, I have become an entrepreneur um, balancing uh, own investments and development of uh, small uh, businesses with board mandates among which IKEA or Arista or AO World or Barclays Private Bank as well as private equity uh, board uh, and lead operations Operating director work for, for example, toys uh, in the partners group environment. Amazing, amazing. Such a wealth of experience. Thanks for joining us, Louisa. Steve, quick introduction. Sure. Uh, Steve Glickman, I, I run an advisory shop um, called Develop LLC. Um, my background was in the Obama administration working on economic policy um, and I was involved in creating a program in the U.S. called the Opportunity Zone Program, which is a a method of getting private capital into low-income communities. And now I advise um, private equity firms and venture firms and also uh, technology companies uh, who are interested in executing strategies that are at the intersection between private capital and public sector goals. Uh, and I'm sure we'll talk about a few of those. Yeah, fantastic. Thanks, Steve. And Alicia? Sure. So thank you so much. Uh, pleasure to be here. My name is Alicia Surrett. I'm the founder and CEO of Pantegrion Capital, which is basically a vehicle for my own angel investments. I spent my career mostly in the asset management industry. And uh, my former job, I had been the first employee and CAO of what we grew into a multi-billion dollar asset management firm. So I was kind of on the entrepreneurial track and then became an angel investor. And now, in addition to investing, I sit on two public boards, a uh, private board, and also have sat on a number of advisory boards for startups. I have dabbled in media work for CNBC and MSNBC here. I've written for Inc. I've taught at Columbia. So I'm kind of uh, all on the entrepreneurial circuit, circuit, but especially very active on the board front. So looking forward to this session. Thank you. Amazing. Thanks so much, Alicia. Well, look, we'll just crack on with some questions. We're going to take a couple of questions to each of the panelists. And then we, if we've got time at the end. We can go into some roundtable or riff off some of the feedback from each other. Louise, if I can kick off with you, I suppose one of the key bits we talk about is the relationship between the board and the CEO. Maybe give us a little bit of your dynamic and feedback on, you know, how boards can take ownership for the development of their CEOs. Well, listen, in dynamic environments, I think the solidity of that relationship is tested for the good and for the bad. And uh, it is obviously an opportunity to reflect on the relationship and to reflect on the respective skills as well, because often the relationship is not good because either site may not have the right skills and the roles may not be fully clear. And uh, often there's then overlap and, and, and dynamics that are not always, uh, you know, effective and also not fast. So in this tested uh, environment that we are currently living, I have seen that dynamic really either become super strong, and that has particularly happened in my private equity environment, where the trust through this joint work has you know, been built and solidly built. 
Um, I have also seen situations, perhaps in listed boards, where due to a lot of external governance pressures, um, there was so much additional pressure that, you know, was required to formally sit down and discuss the situation. And I think the board is challenged because suddenly it sees itself with its usual governance and strategy role. But there's also an expectation that the members could start providing coaching to their CEO. And most of them are not used to that or may never have seen their role that way. So building coaching skills and coaching, you know, in short, maybe something of tough and of love. And, you know, the mix must be right. And you need to apply it in the right moment, in the right way. Um, and clarity and transparency. And most CEOs may not be ready mentally to receive coaching from anybody, maybe even less from their board. So suddenly we have to make work. And uh, I have noticed that some board members may rise to the occasion quite unexpectedly. They may not be the SID or the chair or any of these. Maybe one person somewhere in the board who typically, you know, maybe one of several, but who may rise because of personal skills, because of personal credibility that he or she may have. And may, dare I say that often it's she's who <laughs> raise. Uh, I'm saying this a bit provocatively, but it's an important, interesting one. And empirically, I would say I have the data to show a little sense <laughs> have the data to show that what I'm saying has some basis. And interesting dynamics evolve because I think when the CEO in this situation is also able to show some vulnerability, he or she becomes much more credible towards his organization often towards investors, because let's not kid ourselves. In today's world, nobody can stand up and say, I'm fully in control. I know everything. And, you know, here is where it's going. That would be clearly not credible. And I think then the board starts also opening up differently. And I think we're coming to a more transparent and more productive relationship. That's fantastic. I think that we, we, we hear so much about the authenticity and vulnerability that's, you know, changing the dynamic completely. You know, thank you so much. That was such a, I think we'll come back to that one on uh, later on, Louisa. Thank you for that. Uh, Alicia, I mean, through the, the pandemic, I mean, you know, how boards get repositioned, like especially now. Um, what do you think or what is your approach when advising boards on the makeup and the, the, the setup of the boards, the be it advisory or the board of directors? Sure. Well, so thank you for that question. I think first it's probably helpful if I just um, maybe give a little bit of background as to the difference with advisory boards and boards of directors. Did, did we lose our moderator? Is it? <laughs> okay. I'll just keep answering the question and then hopefully he joins us again. Um, so on the advisory board front, and our panelists probably know this, um, that's often more relevant for early stage companies, right? So um, in the very early stages, when you don't have a lot of cash to pay board members, you're often building a, a strategic group of people um, that can kind of help you as you grow. Um, it, this it's not a, a fiduciary board. There's no fiduciary responsibility. You can't fire the CEO. It really is almost like a consulting relationship, right? So advisory boards, it's kind of like you um, figure out what the voids are in your company and you address them through the advisory board. Maybe you want to bring on someone with legal expertise, maybe someone with industry experience, maybe someone who has been an entrepreneur in the past and ex. bring out a, an arrangement that's like, you know, you'll advise me for one year for 0.25% of the company and that will vest in a year, right? So so that is, you know, that's kind of a, a looser relationship and very strategic in nature. I think in this time, you know, the, the board of directors, the formal board of directors has been um, more of the focus uh, and it's certainly been shaken up in this environment. Um, the, the formal board of directors, which most people are kind of familiar with on the public board front and some large private companies, you do have a fiduciary responsibility to the company. You, you can fire the CEO. You, you are in that position of, of responsibility. Um, the formal boards often have different committees, audit to look at the finances, governance to look at all the policies, compensation to think about how the uh, CEO is um, incentivized. You're overseeing, you know, public filings, regulator relationships. Yes, you're getting involved in strategic discussions. In the background, but you're, what's that? Sorry. 
Um, so, and you're you're basically overseeing shareholder relationships. Uh, uh, you could possibly be sued if you're not doing your your job right. Um, you're overseeing transactions, M and A, tech systems, what's going on in the market. So, I mean, that's kind of the overview of advisory boards versus public boards of directors. And I would say, especially in this environment, you know, being able to supplement your advisory board with whatever strategic uh, advice you need at the moment is very important. And then for the public boards, you know, the responsibility has just been notched up like multiple, multiple levels because yeah. you are dealing with the ups and downs in the markets. You are dealing with extra regulatory focus. You are dealing with your fiduciary responsibility and the legal ramifications of that. And so there's definitely been a huge focus on, um, on the responsibilities in that area too. I don't know if that answers your question, but no, just to great. set the stage, it's like, these are, you know, two very different topics. No, fantastic. Thank you so much, Alicia. And I know we come to the ESG topic a little bit later on, but maybe uh, Steve, I mean, with the amazing experiences you've got, if we could focus on kind of how boards can address the two big areas, community development and sustainability. I don't know how you want to pick them apart, but like two areas I know you're very passionate about. <laughs> Sure. Those are, and those are huge topics. Um, yeah. <laughs> you, but you, you've I, only got three minutes. Yeah. <laughs> well, good. No pressure, Steve. No pressure. <laughs> Normally only talk three or four times longer than I'm supposed to. Uh, you know, I, I want to, rather than maybe diving into that too much now, I want to maybe lay out the scope of the problem as I see it, which is a huge one. There's this major like crisis around our not just our institutions, but our citizenships, how we view the value of people and how we view the value of companies. And we've somehow got this to such a narrow box that corporates have this very narrow role in our society, which by the way is a new phenomenon. This is only in the last few decades where their job is just to produce stuff very cheaply so people can buy it very cheaply. And we've cheapened, in my view, the role of what corporations could and should be doing. I mean, it was not that long ago that corporations were the stewards of their community, both environmentally and in terms of, um, in terms of community development providing training, ownership, supporting entrepreneurships, you know, being really a creature of their communities. And that's all gone away. And it's come at this terrible cost, not just corporations being now at, I, I think, much more vulnerable to regulation internationally and nationally, but the people are losing faith in our system. And that has terrible consequences if it spins out of control. Um, I think in, in the U.S. and being in D.C., not that long ago, we saw <laughs> we saw almost a coup. I mean, yeah. maybe exactly a coup in the world's most powerful economy and democracy. We've, we see, the, you know, the European Union, um, if not falling apart, had, facing a huge body blow in the in the loss of the U.K. and increasingly losing its ability to exert power on the world stage. And, you know, we've gotten to this point, I've just read this book, Tyranny of Merit, by this great Harvard professor, Stephen Mandel, where he talks about the real problem that people are facing is that their worth is tied up with their ability to contribute to this economic system. And the failure of doing that means that they're not worth anything. And in, in the U.S. in particular, the idea of our governance is all <laughs> boiled around the fact that if people can't produce, they're, they're not deserving. So there's this whole notion that everything is tied up with what value you can provide economically and very little is tied up to what your value is as a citizen to contribute to the strengthening of our institutions, our communities, our democracy. And, and I believe corporations have a way bigger role and boards have a much more important role than they're now uh, asserting to get there. And we can talk about ways you could do that in terms of community development, certainly around sustainability, around their role as a global citizen. You're starting to see that pendulum swing a bit with BlackRock and the idea that CEOs are going to be judged based on their contribution to the environment and the contribution to yep. how they treat people. But we're moving way too slowly. It was, I'll end with one quick quote and talking longer than I should. Um, you know, there's this famous quote by an American president, that the business of America is business. And went on to say that businesses, Americans just want their businesses to produce and to create jobs and to drive the economy. That was, of course, President Calvin Coolidge, who ended his presidency in early 1929, a famous year that felt a lot like the 20s now, which led to the Great Depression and almost the crippling of the of America, where I suspect we, if we don't change the current course, we will see the U.S. and Europe there in the next decade as well. So I believe that this is an imminent, important problem that, uh, you know, that we need to solve. Steve, that was unbelievably on three minutes. That's like, <laughs> scary. That's, uh, we'll have to have you back. 
<laughs> well, maybe, may, may Steve, just, just to kind of riff on a little bit more on the, the sustainability piece, the reforestation, kind of carbon neutrality, like anything you're seeing going on there at the moment, which is impressing you or which needs to just happen like faster and, and more? What's well, undoubtedly true that, and it's not just BlackRock, I think it's also a big vacuum in the Trump administration of having cared about this issue. I'm a partisan Democrat for the record, but I, but I, undoubtedly true. We pulled out of Paris. This was not a focus. It's a much bigger focus of this administration. Companies are now starting to focus on it for their own survival. They know that regulations are coming, that expectations are changing. Uh, but you've seen probably, you know, 50 to 100 companies announce carbon uh, new, net carbon neutral goals just over the past six months huge companies big commitment to by 2030 2040 2050 i think by the time you get to 2050 it doesn't count anymore because that ceo knows they're not going to be around anymore to have to figure it out and this is a very comp- it's complicated to solve i mean there's some pre-existing methodologies of getting there through renewable energy and carbon offsets i think that's the table stakes i think there's a much bigger question about how um, this question around carbon neutrality leads to things like reforestation, t- planting trees at scale. The World Economic Forum wants to see a trillion trees planted. That very exercise will contribute to a 25 to 30 percent drop in world uh, you know, carbon reduction. And it's something that's you know doable. Salesforce made a commitment of 100 million trees, Verizon 20 million. These are big commitments and yet still way too small to make the that one trillion impact we need to see. It's become much cheaper to plant trees now than it was. You can plant trees for under a dollar a tree. There's much stronger monitoring and verification. I think one important piece we need to get and we need to push, boards need to push companies on and companies need to push outside groups on is how to uh, ensure that tree planting is included as part of, you know, our traditional um, armament of carbon offsets and are treated the same way we treat selling renewable energy credits because they they have far more impact. And I think you're going to see a huge growth in this conversation over this next year. Companies, although they've made these commitments, really have no idea how they're going to live up to them. Amazing. Thanks, Steve. I'm going to see if we can bring uh, Mick in. Mick is, I'm going to try to do this. Mick? Mick, are you there? Hey, look at that. <laughs> Mick, I've, I've given Mick the mic. That is fantastic. <laughs> Amazing. Mick, great to have you on. Thanks a million. Absolutely. Mick, and I'm listening Mick, intently to everyone's brilliance. I just and we can see it there. We can see it there. We just couldn't get you in. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. I'm gonna just I'm gonna go to Alicia on continuing that ESG thing. I think that's so topical. And then Mick, I'll come back to you and then back to Louisa if that's okay, yeah? Sure. Uh, Alicia, are you okay to, to continue just riffing off on the ESG piece? I know it's something sure. you're very passionate about as well. So yeah, so um, so I'm going to give you a little bit of information from the perspective of being a public board member. And I think what's really going on in this broader environment to build on some of the things that Steve was saying is that there's a focus that's shifting from the shareholder to the stakeholders, right? So there was this this kind of theory in the markets for a long time that all you should care about is the stock price and the shareholders. And now that whole mentality is changing. And by stakeholders, that means not only your shareholders, but it means your employees' best interests, your community that you're a part of, your suppliers, your partners, the environment around you. And it's the recognition that the board is responsible for understanding the impact that the company has on all of these different areas. And ESG, environmental, social, and governance, is really just kind of the continuation of what we used to know as corporate social responsibility. But the difference, I think, is really um, ESG is based on financially material risks. And then again, that's where it comes back to the fiduciary duty of the public board member to care about all of these things and to recognize the importance of them. So just for example, on the environmental front, that's being aware of climate change. That's understanding our energy use as a company, our water use as a company, our greenhouse gas emissions. On the uh, social front, that's understanding the health and safety of our employees during COVID. That That's understanding, you know, whether we make it okay for them to join a union, whether we're not using child labor in other parts of the world and how we respect their privacy. And on the governance front, it's understanding our policies around ethics and our diversity on the board and, you know, how we reach out to shareholders. So it really is a broadening of the mandate. Um, and it's relevant for board members to know about because all the money is flowing into ESG. And if you want your stock price to appreciate, you've got to deal with these things. But more importantly, it's the right thing to do. And companies that 
are ESG friendly, often perform better regardless. Um, and so there really is a movement in the markets to address this through ratings agencies, through industry frameworks like TCFD and SASB. Uh, and there's a, um, a focus for the companies to really say, here are the risks that we have on the ESG front. Here's how we're going to address them. And here's how we're going to measure our progress over time. And coming back to Steve's point, climate risk is really one of the key things at the heart of that with greenhouse gas emissions. But it's all of these things. It's all of the ESG components that I mentioned. Fantastic. Thank you, Alicia. That was that was wonderful. Mick, um, we're going to talk a bit about purpose. Um, obviously, like a, such a, a massive area for you that you're renowned for. Mick, Mick what, like through disruptive times, how can a board help ensure that a business is being led like with purpose? Well, I think that um, one of the things that I think that companies today need to consider Uh, the amount of information that the general public has access to used to be relegated to hackers who were hacking the mainframe in conspiracy theory movies of the 1980s. And now that's just public domain that everyone have access, has, has access to. So I think that right now what has to happen for companies is that they have to realize that you can be a company and have uh, a scattering of of purpose of some CSG, uh, you know, some corporate or CSR corporate social responsibility initiatives, and and I kind of look at that in in a way where it could be interpreted as just checking a box, you know, it's. a transformative place in the ecosystem of the space that that company plays in because it's now table stakes for people to claim purpose. It's now table stakes for people to say that there's some type of, you know, bigger thing that they stand for. Sometimes I think that that's paper thin and it's greenwashing. Um, but I think that the public and the consumer, especially if you're a consumer facing entity, they, they, that's a very thin veil for them to, to be able to see through. So I think it, when you're looking, you ask the question, Mark, about a board, I think that the board conversation goes even bigger to not just the board, but it goes to just how you communicate and demonstrate what your commitment is to whatever you're committed to. But if it ain't legitimate, if it ain't genuine, you will be, you will be found out quickly and been kind of, you, you will have your consumer uh, kind of roll their eyes. And Mick, just, just, uh, uh, just on the topic of like excuses or, Oh, look, it's not a priority. I don't have time for it. That sounds great. But like, I'm just not right now. Like the, just your thoughts on how to drive that urgency and remove those excuses. Hey, look for us, we always say this. Um, there's study upon study that shows that if a company truly stands for purpose, that consumers will, will make a decision to purchase their product or go with their service over another one. They'll choose purpose over product. And it, all things being relatively equal, right? If you're, if you're a crap company and you've got big purpose, you know, that you're not going to get into the game. So we're talking about some kind of level of equality there. Um, I just feel like right now it, it, doing good is good for your brand. It's good for recruiting. It's easier to recruit people. If you, if you have a purpose, a, a legitimate purpose behind you, once you have someone in a highly competitive marketplace, it is easier to retain those people. Harvard did a study showing that some companies that are stand for purpose grow faster than companies that don't. So at the end of the day, I would say, and I'm doing a bit of kind of Ayn Rand uh, semantic spinning here, but act in your own enlightened self-interest, like be selfish, like do what's best for your company and doing what's best for your company, by the way, is most likely going to be what's best for your community or the cause 
or whatever it is that you stand for. So to me, I think it puts the, 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 the corporate and private sector in an incredible position of power to not have to wait for massive nonprofits, well-intended, established, incredible nonprofits that don't move as fast. But what's going to move faster, the UN with their sustainable development goals or a company that's trying to grab market share and realizes, wow, if we really, really own this particular space of deforest, preventing deforestation or saving the whatever it might be, that that's actually good for our business, great. Go, go for what's good for your shareholders in trying to actually create a, you know, a, a solution or a position that is better for the world. Thanks, Mick. And Louisa, having looked at some of those kind of topics that boards are kind of now like discussing and relevant, what are you seeing in terms of the skill sets needed to be a real kind of impactful player within the boardroom at the moment? So how are those skill sets changing? It's very interesting. I think they're changing fundamentally. And um, uh, because the role has changed uh, and ESG is and digitalization for me are the two drivers that are really changing the game for the skills and while at the very beginning when one started to talk about digital or ESG there was kind of a super duper expert who would be hired into the board with a narrow deep expertise and then you know you would say digital and you would look at him or her and he or she would say what should happen and very quickly we found out that that was actually totally counterproductive because the board as a total needs to have a level that is high enough to immerse digital across everything. And the same is now happening on ESG. ESG is not a functional specialism. ESG permeates, you know, from the start, your strategy development. You set your purpose, but the purpose is not some, you know, uh, detached thing. It is what's the reason for existence of our business. And this, therefore, is integral to our business model. And, you know, in my executive career, I have had the pleasure to work twice with Paul Pullman at Procter & Gamble. And I think Paul managed at Unilever a series of years ago to start with the clarity that, you know, purpose is not some philanthropic thing we do as long as we have budget. And we all know that when uh, we have to cut, it's the first that goes. It's not an extra it's the core. And therefore, you know, it is the way we the reason we do business and the reason we're able to do business on a longer term basis, because we don't only take out of the planet or of society, we also give back. And uh, in that sense, the skills of the board need to be broader. People on the board need to be able to see connections, not just specialisms, but they need to be able to go deep as well uh, in specific subject matter areas where they will be the experts. And I think that T-shape and people who clearly see the total system, I think is important. And then when you sit in the audit committee, you make the link, for example, to risk that you bring in into you know, the sustainability committee. And interestingly, also the remuneration committee has nothing to do anymore with a few people who are kind of experts in in this specialism, but remuneration is core to performance achievement and performance achievement needs to be steered according to not just short term financial measures, but mid and long term measures that are also not financial. And then at the end, there's an appreciation of the Remco that may also mean that bonuses and variable compensation don't turn out just like only the numbers would indicate. So I think it's it's all about breadth with some depth. But the breadth actually becomes very important because on the depth, you can go and get experts to support you. And uh, that makes it some uh, much more interesting on a board because I think the conversations clearly become for a chair also more difficult to steer because you have to be able to go broad, broad, uh, broad and make connections. And um, there's also another thing, and that's not a skill per se, but the diversity of board membership gets to a, you know, becomes a premium. Not because and different countries in Europe where I am have different approaches to this, uh, but, you know, and it's not just about having different representations. 
It's about including the differences and making those differences on the board a plus out of which you get more richness, right? And that's not done with only having representation. I think the chair's role is also evolving in terms of how to really facilitate and drive a board to that more than the sum of its parts. And I think the chair, the gain for the chair skills is also upping quite considerably. Fantastic. Thanks, Louisa. We're going to go, um, I want to touch upon the topic. We're just entering the last like kind of 12, 14 minutes of the of the, the live stream. So I just want to make sure. We've got a great question to finish with Mick. So I'm going to finish with Mick. I'm going to get Steve on how boards should act in a crisis. We just want to touch upon the topic with Louisa and Alicia on diversity in the boardroom. What you guys are experiencing has the pandemic like increased opportunities or is there any shifts you're kind of seeing Maybe Louise, if you want to kick off first, then we'll go to Alicia. That would be um, that would be amazing. Has the pandemic increased diversity on boards? Is that your question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are you seeing more opportunities out there? Or what's your sense in in that uh, in the diversity space regarding I board opportunities? I would say that it was the pandemic. I think yeah. <laughs> in Europe. It- And you have to start talking, right? You also cannot get out of the conversation by just saying there just aren't any, right? Or there are, uh, look harder, right? And I think the discussion on diversity, I feel in the various countries I'm involved in, has moved from just having representation to how do you actually bring diversity of discussion, of thinking in the discussion. Uh, and that's not done only with representation. Um, no doubt the women's uh, representation in Europe has in all countries moved forward enormously. I think ethnicity much less. And I think currently in the UK, that has become the point to really drive. And I think, again, for consumer facing companies, which is where I'm involved, uh, very clearly, uh, that is easy to explain as, you know, society, consumers, et etc., are more diverse. And I think there's, there's something good happening there. It's not just about representation. It is about what do we do with it and what does it bring to the business? So positive. Yes. Thanks, Louisa. Uh, Alicia, what are your thoughts? Uh, yeah, so this is a big movement right now, and I'm absolutely seeing change. I'm not sure if it's for the right reasons, but I'm definitely seeing change. And the reason for that is that it's a push from, one, the ratings agency. So you have new mandates coming out from major players like ISS saying that we are going to vote against you uh, in our uh, shareholder propo- in your shareholder proposals if you don't have diversity on your board. So you have the rating agencies saying that. You have the stock exchanges like NASDAQ coming out and saying, look, it's a requirement now if you're going to be listed on our exchange. We expect by this date you're going to have at least one woman, at least one person of color or LGBTQ identifying uh, candidate on your board. Uh, then you have the investors, the Black Rocks and the state streets of the world saying this is an imperative. We're going to vote against you. We're not going to invest if you do not have this kind of diversity. Um, and so we have all of these, you know, confluence of different uh, major influencers saying this is a must. Right. And if you don't, you're going to lose out because you're not going to have the investors and your rating agencies are going to vote against you. And so it's going to hurt your stock price. And so therefore, it's the fiduciary duty of the board to make a change. And I think that the change is happening, but it's slow because um, there aren't a lot of uh, companies out there that for reasons of term uh, term limits have turnover that, um, you know, where you see constant refreshment of the board. But I would say, Yes, there's change. Yes, it's moving in the right direction. And yes, it's being forced by influencers in the industry. Thank you so much, Alicia. Steve, on the the whole, I mean, it's been such a brutal year for so many businesses. It's been a moment of opportunity for others. So, I mean, the crisis, you know, opportunities for some and different degrees of hemorrhaging for, for others. How have you seen or what are your thoughts on how boards have played a role in, in helping steer companies through the, the crisis? Uh- um, uh, thanks, Mark. I'm going to do the politicians thing of turning around your question <laughs> and answering the question <laughs> that I want to answer. <laughs> but but uh, but I will turn around. Listen, I think boards, practically speaking, in the heart of the crisis and pandemic is a little different because it's such an extended 
series of events don't have a huge role in it, but they do have a big role in preparing for the sort of crises the company can effectively deal with. So to tie back to the things I really care about. So smooth, this, Steve. So smooth. It, no, it's undoubtedly true that this question of the separation of companies from our communities and our environment is becoming a huge, a huge crisis at, of, of massive proportions that we're by tearing that apart, and it's affecting them in real ways. Let me look what's happening to the large technology companies. There is a real, and I believe we're going to be a very dangerous conversation for them that's happening among regulators in Congress around um, the uh, around the monopolization of basic technology infrastructure by a handful of companies. And the fact that, you know, crises in the U.S., for example, around our elections and the use of Twitter and Facebook to manipulate them have become a, now a massive problem for those companies. And I, just, and I believe that real regulation is coming for them in terms of the types of markets that they can operate in simultaneously, in terms of the type of advertising they can do and who they can in terms of the amount of political engagement and how they can do it. And. But it's something none of those companies were prepared for, and it was totally predictable <laughs> that this would be coming down the pipeline. Even if you just saw a little bit of the chatter, you know, coming from, and no one expected populism, I think, on both sides to take the amount of uh, grab it has. But the reason it has is because of these same problems we're talking about, because people are dissatisfied with what our leadership in both the public and private sector are doing to deal with these massive problems that they know that they're going to have to reckon with. Growing inequality, which is really the direct result of a lack of community development and investment, and a, a planet that is facing its its doom because we're not doing the things we can do now to control for the expansion of climate change. And I think a board here actually has a tremendously powerful role. CEOs, in my view, really are going to drive uh, the extent to which their senior executive team is taking it seriously. But a CEO will, I think, bend on these issues, if not to get them off their back on things that maybe they care more about. Yeah. If they know that there's a board that really cares about ESG as being poor to them, and by scratching that itch, they'll get a, you know, a bit more leniency on the stuff that maybe they're more focused on operationally. So maybe to get back to Mick's point, I think it's Hard to get companies to see this. I agree with everything you said. I just think it's hard to get them to care about this because it's it has such a medium and long term effect on most companies in a way that's hard for them to. They're not really incentivized in the right way to care about that stuff. But board, but CEOs do care about annoying board members. And if a board member is saying, "Hey, I really want you to have a real sustainability strategy," and uh, that's really important to me, and if you can do that for me, I will like give you a, some breathing room and some other stuff. I think it will matter, and certainly if the whole board is around a couple key issues that they that they want the CEO to focus on in that way, it will make a difference. And I do think then it plays out during a time of crisis like these three companies are facing with our Congress. They'll be much better prepared to think about it because they just had organically built it in. It doesn't always have to be a crisis. I mean, some of this stuff was avoidable. The pandemic I put in a different category. If the board is arming their team with forcing them to think about it, and then when the you know, time of crisis comes, they'll be better prepared to do it. But once you're in the middle of a crisis, I think it's too late for the board to do much because you really got to expect your management team to get in there and 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 address it. Thanks, Steve. I'm going to make we're going to just kick over with you the last question on uh, instigating innovation from the boardroom right the way through the organization. But then I just want to loop back to everybody on an example of a company that they're seeing is really getting it right at the moment. Um, so if you can loop back at the end, just on an example from each of you, who you're admiring, who's getting it right at the moment. Um, Mick, if you could kick us off on um, instigating innovation, I mean, through a pandemic, through a crisis, I mean, where do you start? How do you kind of, you know, I I ignore some of the absurdities out there and really get focused on, on innovation? Well, I mean, it's from the standpoint of how to do this from the board side, the most of the conversations that I'm having are conversations from the C-suite side, right? So I just know, and and I don't, uh, Steve, disagree that a, an annoying squeaky wheel on the board is going to be able to push things a little bit faster, just if nothing else, just to stop the squeak. Um, if that's, though, the position of a CEO that – any type of strategy that is um, founded in purpose is a squeaky wheel, then I think him or her is not long for that position. If that's going to be there, if they're, if that's what they're trying to grow as a company, they're going to, they're going to be a, an in and out CEO. That's my position just because I think that the, the patience 
for the consumer right now is is very little if they think that companies are just just doing it for shareholder value, just printing, just doing this for their own interest, and they don't have a greater interest involved. That's and I don't think that that's kind of uh, airy fairy. I just think that that's kind of what what's happening right now. If there's one thing that you saw in this last year is that people justified or unjustified people will pounce if they feel that there's an injustice taking place. Right. Um, and so I think, I think CEOs just have to be, they have to get out ahead of that and make sure that their, their position within any type of purpose ridden space is something that can be founded. Like if someone kicks the tires, they're going to actually be able to see there's some legitimacy there. So as far as instigating innovation, at that level, um, you know, we have one of the things that has happened to us over the last couple of years is companies have seen us as the how the hell are they doing it, kids, and have brought us in to, uh, I don't like to use the C word, the consult word very much, but have brought us in to try to instigate a culture of innovation. And so we have taken our design thinking and our design approach and and taken that and taken that into the C-suite and taking it into the executive level and said, how can you uh, adopt, abide by, borrow some of the principles that we, that we instigate on and, and utilize on a day-to-day basis throughout all the things that we create? How can you adopt that for a bigger organization, an organization much larger than ourselves? And so what we're seeing is everything from truly, truly, adopting communication channels to everyone who is either hourly or salary from some of the bigger companies to ask to in it, like asking them about innovation from the employee standpoint um, to, and, and really auditing and ingesting that feedback. You know, one of the principles of not impossible is that degrees, diplomas and credentials can empower you and can hinge you, but they're not necessarily the thing that entitle you to create or innovate. It's a perspective. And sometimes the best perspective on an environment, like an environmental policy would be the trash collector because he is actually touching trash every day. And if you can't tap in to that perspective in a meaningful way, then you're just going to be talking about theory at the kind of the esoteric level and you're not going to really dig in. So we really, in all the engagements that we have, we espouse and cr- tremendous communication all the way up and down and then, and then implementing what we kind of not impossible best practices on, on instigating that innovation. Amazing. Mick, that was perfect. Thank you for that. Very insightful. Louisa quickly, who, who, who's getting it right out there? Who are you admiring at the moment? Ikea. <laughs> <laughs> for three reasons. Uh, and it's all under the umbrella of our founder, Ingvar, always having said, every crisis will make us stronger. And if you take that, not just as a buzzword, but you actually translate that into a method, when the crisis hits, you get ready to become better. And you start by assessing very clearly your strengths. And the crisis normally brings your weaknesses up and visible, and you don't have any more to discuss whether it is a weakness because you can see it every day. And then you go about fixing it very deeply, very fast. And you rally employees around it. And uh, employees, when you're customer facing and retail, uh, are really rallied around the idea to be the place for your customers to go and to provide also additional contribution to society in this moment. And, you know, one example, I'll stick to that only. The rest, I'm sure you're all IKEA customers. And if you're not, I hope you... These hands have made... (laughs) <laughs> in every country we've lived, uh, unbelievable amounts of IKEA stuff. So. That's fantastic. I'm so proud of you, and uh, hopefully you are of IKEA. But let me tell you what uh, you all know that domestic violence has spiked during these lockdowns. Uh, the numbers are terrible. And IKEA not only being the place that sells home furnishing, but wanting actually in its purpose to provide a better life, a better everyday life for the many, has stepped up and actually uh, shown a point of view, provided practical solutions for domestic violence in particularly the countries that were affected most uh, across Europe. Uh, And said, and we have a right to have a point of view and actually to contribute and intervene actively because home 
life at home starts with safety at home uh, and 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 so i think it is in this moment where you can see in fact the purpose of a company coming to life uh you know beyond the simple pursuit of daily sales and profit and cash amazing that's a great example thank you so much for sharing that louisa alicia Sure. So, Louise, I love that example. Thank you. Um, so I wasn't sure where I was going to go with this, but I actually would highlight a portfolio company of mine called Nomad. I don't know if you're familiar with them. They do smartphone accessories. And oh, yeah. during the um, pandemic, they quickly pivoted and they started uh, making masks and distributing masks. And this wasn't really kind of a you know profit focused thing. They just thought it was the right thing to do. They made a tremendous difference. Millions and millions of masks went out. Um, they have also done campaigns where they've um, profiled their women employees. They began speaking up around racial justice issues like their Instagram just blows me away. I mean, they're basically a group of really young, scrappy, um, passionate uh, em uh, employees that um, that really build their whole business around sustainability and they live and breathe it. I mean, this is something that's like core to their hearts. And I'm really inspired by them because it's not something that they have to do. It's not something that they necessarily have the resources for. But if you, um, you know, to, to mix point, if you understand them as a brand, you understand that that is core to who they are. Um, and I've just been blown away by watching them in this environment. So I, I, I would say Nomad, even though it's not really a, a recognizable company to many, it's, it's been inspirational to me. That was a great example. Thanks, Alicia. Steve, I mean, obviously, the, the areas you're absolutely passionate about, who, who, who are you admiring at the moment out there? Well, first of all, I, I love the previous two examples. Uh, both companies I, I know pretty well. Um, there's a company I uh, was an early investor in run by two friends of mine uh, called Aspiration. They're a fintech platform out of L.A., started very interestingly in not charging fees to their customers for banking services and asking for a, basically a tip. And it turns out they got above industry fees as a result. But what they've really done for the last five years is uh, create a way for their customers through regular everyday actions to learn a lot about who they were buying from and how those companies treat people in the environment and to incentivize actions from them, but also to enable, no surprise here, tree planting in all of their transactions. They, they're now the biggest owner of, 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 uh, trees essentially they they have the option to plant five billion trees through a network that they've wow. built um around the world they have a their company has a commitment to 100 million trees and they're not a you know they're a, they're a meaningfully sized company they're a multi-billion dollar company but they're not they're not a, a behemoth and you know now they're they're working to provide what they're doing on the customer level to other enterprise um companies that are looking to solve their own sustainability and tree planting challenges and you know they've kind of coined this term around the good economy that the future the sharing economy of the 2010s will be the good economy of the 2020s and it, you know i think to everyone's point here you can do better as a company by doing good it does affect the bottom line it does affect your brand it does affect who will buy from you and their their role really is facilitating that i think as much as they can so i would check them out it's a great example thanks steve Make apart from not impossible, then who else is getting it right? I mean, I think Robinhood is getting it great because how can you, you know, a good company yeah. that just totally tries to excise the little person and really, yeah. you know, preach that they're supposed to defend the little person and then just totally screwing them over. I mean, there's <laughs> uh, that's just that's just a great way. I didn't to, know you give sarcastic <laughs> answers. I have a lot of sarcastic answers. <laughs> Uh, I mean, we always, what's funny is we call ourselves these Robin Hood do-gooders, hackers and makers and, Ro and Robin Hood, the fintech company has now taken that away from our vernacular. We can't say Robin Hood as these people who are trying to do good anymore because yeah. now they're a bunch of, now they're perceived as a bunch of assholes that are trying to keep everybody <laughs> down. So um, the, the, a company that we spun off um, in July this year is a company that was focused on what we saw as a massive, massive social and residual effect of the pandemic. And that is uh, focused around food insecurity, because I think what you're what you're looking at right now, especially in in our fair country here, is as you're seeing that tremendous income divide that exists and now that's been exacerbated to where it's just been it's spread out even further and that divide now is not just people who have a 
have an income divide, but people who are actually sleeping in beds or sleeping in apartments or something, there's a roof over their head and people are sleeping in cars and ground. So um, we saw that and the trajectory of food insecurity and hunger in this country. And now what would happen because of the pandemic is something that we had to deal with. And so we launched uh, a platform called Bento, which is an enterprise software that deploys on the side of the nonprofit or the community-based organization, the city, any group who owns a constituency of people who would classify as food insecure, right? And food insecure doesn't mean starving. Food, is in, food insecure doesn't mean, you know, sleeping on the streets. It just means you're, you're, there is a insecure understanding of where the, all of your it's meals come from. from. Yeah. You know, and so we deployed this and it's a super simple platform that uh, took a took a while to develop. But you ingest the cell phone numbers of the constituents of the people that you serve. And then it starts a five text chat chat prompt that invites someone to enter their address, choose a restaurant and then choose a menu item from that restaurant. So what we've done is we've we've fragmented um, and distributed the supply chain within the food insecure population because typically they would have to make these migrations to food pantries or soup kitchens, wait in line for four or five hours and then get a mystery box of food. Sometimes had good stuff, sometimes had you know Twinkies and, and Slim Jims. And so now there's a way that's incredibly data-driven um, that creates geo-proximate convenient sources for people to get fed. And at the same time, and this is part of what we really preach in all of our design thinking here is how to create a frictionless ecosystem because the organization that represents the constituency just has to put the cell phone numbers in and then they're done and to connect the bank account to it and then they're done. The restaurants don't even know that they're actually participating in the program because we're, we've tied into Postmates backend system. So if you're a Postmates restaurant, you're automatically serving the population that we're sending through and the constituents don't have to download another stupid app that nobody wants on their phone or no one wants to use. They just text. And that's something that everybody uses. So that's incredible. We, yeah. So we, we just ticked over the hundred thousand meal mark with our pilot groups. Um, and uh, two days before we kind of clicked over there, we had our first million meal order um, wow. from a private equity firm or a private equity consortium in Chicago. So we're going to be fe feeding a million meals in Chicago over the next eight months. And uh, three weeks after that, we had a 500,000 meal order come in from Santa Monica. So you're seeing this as just a way for people to easily and, and they don't have to know it doesn't there's no increase in headcount. There's no increase in operations or, or you just sit on a dashboard and watch how people are being fed and the level of nutritional level of the food. And it's just a matter of it keeping what's it. The keeping what's the name of it again, Nick? Uh, it started off as an initiative called Hunger Not Impossible. We spun it off and it's called Bento, B-E-N-T-O. Okay. Amazing. Wow, that's yeah. like inspirational. Inspirational. That's unbelievable. If, if, if Frank would have us back, we could do the sarcastic answer to those questions. <laughs> that would have been, you know, maybe next time. But guys, I, I'm getting um, uh, all these like flashing things on my screen about stopping the session. We're we're way over time. But like a huge thank you, Louisa, Alicia, Steve, and Mick. It's been like so entertaining. Uh, I think we've got a little connection going now, so it's been a pleasure to connect. Hopefully, we can travel again soon and start seeing each other. But uh, thank you so much for your time, shared insight, and stories this evening. That's been beautiful. Thank you both all very much. Thank you, Mark. Thanks so nice much. Nice to meet you all. Take care, guys. Bye. Nice to meet you all. All the best.